so. Sometimes when we worship, um, it seems a shame to stop. And this morning I really could feel the Holy Spirit in that, ministering to me personally and I'm sure to us collectively as a body. So thank you, Andrew, for leading. As I mentioned earlier, this time of year we very often reflect back. And I don't know what your memory of 2013 is, what your news highlight, your personal highlight or low point might have been. And I just jotted down a few things that I remembered from this year as I was thinking about this morning. It was the Queen's Diamond Jubilee, and that seems like ages ago. It was only in June, but it seems like such a long time ago that there was all that pomp and ceremony happening in London and that great celebration, the uh, monarch of our nation who's been queen for 60 years and all the celebration around that. We saw the passing of two very influential leaders of our time, both Margaret Thatcher and Nelson Mandela passed away. Um, there were lots of natural disasters, home and abroad. There was the uh, Oklahoma devastation, more recently the Philippines, and even more recently, closer to home, the dreadful flooding that we've seen in this country and the devastation of people being left stranded at Christmas and some homes still, I believe, today without electricity since Christmas Eve and the devastation that that brings. And the thing is that these things happen and they're headlines for a while and then we kind of forget. And then we get to New Year's Eve or New Year's Day and the news does a big thing about, you know, the past year. And you go, oh, I'd forgotten about that, I'd forgotten about that. But the reality is the people that are involved in these natural disasters have not forgotten about that because they're still picking up the pieces and will be for some time to come. But there were some great signs of new hope, I think, for for us as Christians this year, two great men of God appointed the new Archbishop of Canterbury, Justin Welby, and a new Pope. And both have done things that I think stand out. Justin Welby took on the payday lenders. Why hasn't someone done that before now? Why are we allowing premiership football clubs to advertise loan sharking? Because it's legalized. It's what it is borrow a pound and pay 6,000 back if you've had it for a year. It's outrageous. But Justin stood up, he was counted, and things hopefully will start to change because one man took a stand. And he's done much more than that. Much, much more than that. The new Pope invited a group of homeless people into the Vatican, including a dog for a meal. He goes out, he meets the poor. He doesn't take his entourage with him. He goes out, he meets people where they're at. Great signs of hope for the church in different parts of the world. Now, I don't know about you, but when God speaks to me, he speaks to me in a number of different ways and through a number of different media, if you like. There's obviously the Bible, there's church, there's people speaking. He speaks to me through my husband, through my daughter, through my family, those close to me. This week, he spoke to me through the newspaper, the Daily Express. Unusual, I don't normally read it. But um, not only did it mention about Justin and uh, Justin Wilby, the new archbishop, and um, the Pope, but there's messages from the Queen, her message of a new hope in the prince that was born earlier th this year, Prince George. But the thing that really struck me and really spoke to me was an article um, by a guy called Leo McKinstry, who I have no idea if he is a Christian or not. But he said... The world must fight savage onslaught against Christians. 
And I was drawn to this because it said, only yesterday, this was Boxing Day's paper, so only yesterday, Christmas Day, 15 died in a bombing in a church in Baghdad. I hadn't even heard about it. I didn't even know about it. When the Boston bombs went off earlier this year, it was in the news for days. But in the Middle East, dozens and dozens of Christians and other people, innocent people, were being slaughtered daily. And we're not hearing about it. This article reads that actually the church is so in decline in the UK that it's in danger of being victimized and marginalized. It's a very powerful piece. And he says, but what are we doing about it? The church has given us so much. What are we doing to protect it? And that really spoke to me. What am I doing? What am I standing up for? What am I believing in? What am I sharing with others? We had a, a beautiful nativity play here. Glad to see the Virgin Mary's here. She did that beautifully. We had a real live baby. It was incredibly powerful. Was everyone here for that? Some of you here for that? Yeah? And there was a very poignant moment in that for me. We all know the story, and it was beautifully acted, and we had a beautiful set of shepherds and a tiny little angel dancing around the front. It was beautiful. And then Martin came with a very small wooden cross and put it on the altar to remind us that the gift of Jesus at Christmas was not the end of the story. It was just the beginning of a story that lasted 33 years and ended with the redemption of the world through the crucifixion. And it was a very, very powerful, simple gesture of putting that cross on the altar, but just a very powerful reminder that what starts and is sometimes made into a bit of a fairy tale ends with something that really was quite graphic and awful for us. So moving on, the Queen mentioned that the birth of Prince George was her highlight and had given the family new hope for the future. In her message, if you heard it, she also quoted Prince Charles. And he was speaking about the Commonwealth when he said, the Commonwealth, the hope and the trust we place in the Commonwealth to bring that touch of healing to the troubled and deliver the best future for our people. Now, hope in its generalist sense is the anticipation of a future outcome. It's subjective. It's an expectation that can be firmly based or just misdirected. And whilst the Queen and the Royal Family and all of us hope for stuff, very often it's like wishing. if that makes sense. So when I was praying about this morning, I asked the, the Lord to lead me to a passage of Scripture. He led me to Romans 5. And if you've got a pew Bible, a church Bible, um, the passage is on page 1132. I'm going to read the first section from verses 1 to 11. And in the NIV version, this particular section is entitled Peace and Joy, which seems appropriate for the season. Therefore, since we have been justified through faith, we have peace with God through our Lord Jesus Christ through whom we have gained access by faith into this grace in which we now stand. And we rejoice in the hope of the glory of God. Not only so, but we also rejoice in our sufferings, because we know that with suffering produces perseverance. Perseverance, character, and character, 
hope. And hope does not disappoint us because God has poured out his love into our hearts by the Holy Spirit whom he has given us. You see, at just the right time when we were still powerless, Christ died for the ungodly. Very rarely will anyone die for a righteous man, though for a good man someone might possibly dare to die. But God demonstrates his own love for us in this. While we were still sinners, Christ died for us. Since we have now been justified by his blood, how much more shall we be saved from God's wrath through him? For if, when we were God's enemies, we were reconciled to him through the death of his son, how much more, having been reconciled, shall we be saved through his life? Not only this so, sorry, not only is this so, but we also rejoice in God through our Lord Jesus Christ, through whom we have now been received reconciliation. And the word that has jumped out to me through all of this is hope. Jesus is our one true hope. If I put my hope in my husband, Jimmy, my daughter, Kirsty, any one of you in this room, at some point I'll be disappointed. Likewise, if you put your hope and trust in me, I'm going to let you down somewhere along the line. I'm going to forget something. I'm not going to do something I've said I will. But in this context, this hope in Scripture, it's not a wishy-washy vague thing. It's something far more certain. It's something far more solid. It's about trust. It's about confidence. It's about knowing who we are in Christ. It's about knowing that the story doesn't end with the birth of a baby in a manger. The story ends with the crucifixion, the death, and the resurrection. All that had to happen to bring that reconciliation, to bring us back to God, to give us access, as it says here. We have access. Jesus has given us direct access to God. That's amazing, isn't it? In the Old Testament, when you read it, God is a, a distant, far more overbearing kind of character, it seems. But his heart is always for his people. His heart is always for his people to be in relationship with him, to follow him, to look to him for the answers not to trust in a lottery ticket to solve all our problems. Many people do that. Week in, week out, they think that pink slip of paper is going to change their lives. And for some of them that have that relevant pink slip of paper, it actually causes more devastation and destruction than they could have ever imagined. Our one true hope, Jesus we don't need anything else. But a time is coming when we may be tested in this. And it may not be that far away. It's happening in the Middle East. We're living in a society where it's very secular. It's very politically correct. Nurses can't offer to pray for patients for fear of losing their jobs. Crosses can't be worn round necks. A persecution is coming. It's foretold. It's coming. And we just need to do our bit. There was a, a lovely picture this morning as we were praying. There were two. One was of uh, looking down aerially onto a swamp land with weeds and briars and people entangled within that and held and the harder they struggled the further they were pulled down and others with swords fighting to free them but the briars and the branches were fighting back it was a real battle a real struggle and there are many people some of you within this room may be struggling with some stronghold on your life 
and the word of God and the people of God are here as a body, we can break those strongholds. We have the true hope, the one true hope that is Jesus. And nothing is impossible in him. It doesn't always happen immediately. It took 33 years for the nativity scene to be fully played out. And if you're struggling with something in your life, then give it to Jesus. Get prayed with at the end of the service. That's what we're about. That's what we're here for. It's not about just coming, singing some lovely songs, hearing a talk, going home, having dinner. It's about being the body of Christ. It's about ministering to each other. It's about praying for each other. It's about laughing together. It's about crying together. It's about sharing our pain, our hurts, our joys, our hopes together as one body. The other picture that we had this morning was that on each seat in the church was a light, a fire, a flame. And it reminded me of the Olympic flame that we had last year where each petal was lit individually and came together to make that one huge flame. Do you remember that? It was very powerful. Lots of little lights. When they come together, it, it was tremendous. It's no good us being isolated. We need to work together in our, in our drive to see other people brought in. There are empty seats here. Wouldn't it be fabulous if they were all full and people were standing at the back and they're in the foyer and we had to open the partition because people want to hear about Jesus. People want to have what we have. And the reality is a lot of people don't even know what it is they're searching for. They're filling their lives with alcohol, with drugs, with sex, with whatever it is. But there's only one thing that fills that void, and that is Jesus, our one true hope. So whatever you're hoping for in the new year, if you think this year was a bit rubbish and you want to draw a line under it and move on, and some people do, they see this very much as a, a line in the sand, if you like, where you can get rid of that and start afresh. You don't have to wait till Wednesday. You can do it right now. Right now, you can commit yourself afresh to hear a new revelation of God. Right now, today, before you leave. That he will work in your life and through your life, he will draw others to you. Sorry, you will draw others to him wrong way around, sorry. That we will mirror that love that God had for us, that he sent Jesus, that we will mirror that to each other and to those outside. That we will be a church without walls. That we will be knocking the walls down. That more churches will be springing up. We don't have to be the Archbishop of Canterbury or the Pope to do our bit in our workplace, in our family, to our neighbours. So whatever you hope for in 2014, put your hope in the one true hope, the gift that we've been celebrating all this week and for the weeks in Advent, that we celebrate every week as Christians, the one true hope that is Jesus. Let's put our trust in him and pray for that fresh revelation. I'm going to um, ask Andrew if he would come and sing the song I, I'm um, and sing the song I, I'm um, and sing the song I.